Okay guys, so I wanted to talk about, I posted over on Reddit, r slash saturated fat, the fact that within 10 days on my new diet, which I described in my video, the optimal omnivore diet, my fasting blood glucose levels went from what had been in the pre-diabetic range for years, um, typically around 115 to 125, 116 to 123, um, something like that was the range, probably the average 118, 119, was the most common reading that I've had. And so I've tried a bunch of different diets to try to get this down. I've tried, I was I should say, when I did the original croissant diet, I wasn't monitoring blood glucose yet. Uh, so I, I wasn't aware how elevated my normal kind of blood glucose was at that time. But especially in the last year, um, the one diet that I did, the feasting mimicking diet, I was monitoring blood glucose, and that did lower my fasting blood glucose into the normal range, but that I didn't find to be sustainable, the essentially uh, alternate day fasting. I, I don't feel like that is long-term gonna be uh, doable for most people. Um, it's hard. And so I wanted I wanted something that was easier. And if you've been following the channel, I've been talking more. I've been trying some more low fat diets. Check out my video, the redox case for carbohydrates in under 10 minutes. And you can see the, the rationale for, for trying some of these low fat, high carb diets. And I've been using supplements designed to get my blood glucose down and including uh, our alpha lipoic acid, which I talk a lot about in these, uh, in my videos, and also SEA, my new supplement that I talk about in last week's video, you're inflamed because you're torpid. And so the optimal omnivore diet really pulls out all the stops. So what what I did was, uh, so, so what I'm doing is I'm restricting uh, protein and especially branched chain amino acids. So branched chain amino acids are high in the protein of muscle meats and they're high in the protein of grains. So if you're doing a high carb diet, you will inevitably get a significant amount of protein from uh, grains, assuming that you're eating the normal grains like uh, rice, wheat, corn, uh, or even if you're eating potatoes, you'll get a lot of branched chain amino acids. So it's still a starch-based diet, but I've swapped out the uh, grains and potatoes for things like cassava, uh, cassava flour. I'm mean, using a low protein uh, flour from Italy called Fior Fiori Glut, F-I-O-R-E-G-L-U-T. Um, I've been using rice noodles, which are starch-based noodles from Asia. And I've been getting most of my protein from gelatin sources like um, broths, soups. Uh, I use gelatin powder in the pancakes that I make in the morning. And I've been eating some things like uh, pig's feet and pork rinds. Seven days into this diet, so, so I, to I told you my normal uh, blood glucose, in the, this is fasting in the morning, average about 119. Um, seven days into this diet, I got a reading of 101. Uh, the next day, I believe it was 96. The day after that, I played basketball. It was 112 the next morning. Sometimes it's high after basket, after I played basketball. I don't know why. Uh, the next morning, it was down to 93. So suddenly, I had three out of four days, I had blood readings of fasting glucose that were in the non- diabetic range. I've been starting my day every day with pancakes that are a half cup of Fior Glut flour, a half cup of cassava flour, one egg, a tablespoon of gelatin, uh, salt baking powder, and just enough water to get to the consistency that I want. Um, and then I use maple syrup and fruit preserves on it. And so this, the, the only protein in this meal is the, is the one egg, which you need to make the pancakes fluffy and the tablespoon of gelatin. The reason for the gelatin, so diabetic and obese humans have elevated levels of branched chain amino acids, and at least in mouse studies, this appears to be causal because you can put a mouse on a, on a high fat diet and they will, they will become obese and they'll become um, insulin resistant. If you put the mice on the same diet, but you just don't feed them the branched chain amino acids, the mice will remain lean. There was a great study, and I'll put the link in the description, um, showing that in fact, in skeletal muscle, and this is really important, in skeletal muscle, so the problem with obesity and diabetes, in my opinion, is that we get something called energy toxicity. And this happens, essentially it means too much fuel in the mitochondria all at once. The analogy that I like to use is a carburetor. So if, you've, uh, if you're old enough to remember cars from 
uh, like the early 80s, I had an ATV when I was a kid that had a carburetor on it. And, and so what would happen is if you have too much, the, the carburetor is the thing that mixes the fuel in the air. And if you have enough oxygen in your carburetor for the amount of fuel that you put into it, uh, it'll burn cleanly and you can you'll you'll burn cleanly and the and the thing goes right but if you get too much fuel into the into the carburetor and um not enough air uh what happens is the thing sputters you get black smoke out of the tailpipe it starts to backfire and eventually it stalls out and that i think is the situation that a lot of us are in we've got black smoke coming out of the tailpipe and we're stalling out because we have too much fuel going into the mitochondria and this can happen for a couple different reasons this can happen because you have too much ppa or alpha this can happen because you have too much blood glucose there's a lot of things that are pushing fat into the mitochondria one of the things that happens is you get a buildup of unburned fats in the form of very short chain fats like acetyl coa butyryl coa which is like a four carbon fat or propionyl, propionyl uh, coa. And these are very short unburned fats and they've burned almost all the way down, but they're kind of piling up. And so one of the things about an obese person or a diabetic person is if you, if you feed them carbohydrates, they can't switch over to burning those carbohydrates as efficiently as a lean person. So in a lean person, you eat the carbohydrates, boom, insulin signals, you switch over, you start burning that glucose. In obese people, that response is delayed by maybe half an hour. And, and one of the reasons is that in the, in the mitochondria, in the obese human, you have this backlog. You have this backlog of acetyl-CoA and, and it's from unburned fat. And um, it can also be from unburned glucose, I should say. But either way, you have this backup of acetyl-CoA. And so insulin signals, the signal to start burning glucose uh, is there but yet you have this backlog of fat that you have to burn through before you can start to burn the glucose. And so then you wind up with high blood glucose and all of the problems that that causes. What the glycine does, so gelatin and pork rinds and pig's feed and um, other connective tissues are made out of collagen. And collagen is about 20 to 25% glycine. Collagen has uh, around four or five times as much glycine as it has branched chain amino acids. Conversely, muscle meats have four or five times as many branched chain amino acids as they have glycine. And the glycine literally goes in, and I'll put the link to this paper in the description. The glycine goes into your skeletal muscle, uh, mitochondria, and it removes these uh, sh these acetyl-CoA, this propionyl-CoA, the things that are preventing you from being metabolically flexible, the things that are overwhelming your mitochondria, and those things actually get connected to the glycine and then you just eliminate them in your urine. According to the paper, the thing that's causing the glycine to be low in the skeletal muscle in the first place is the elevated branched chain amino acids. And so you're eating a lot of, of skeletal muscle uh, you have high branched chain amino acids, uh, you have low glycine coming in, and the branched chain amino acids are pushing glycine levels down even lower. You have this buildup of fuel in the mitochondria. Now you don't have metabolic flexibility to because to burn glucose, you have to you have to get rid of the fat first. You have to get rid of all of those residues of the fat that have been piling up in the mitochondria. So by staying low fat, um, right? So I, I, I'm I'm eating a lot of carbohydrate. I am using supplements to help me burn those carbohydrates, including uh, RALA, which is R-alpha lipoic acid, and SEA, which I sell on my website, steroid ethanolamide. And one of the things that that does is it stops your, it, it lowers tissue necrosis factor alpha and TNF alpha causes your fat cells to release excess fat during the process of lipolysis. And so, so if you want to burn glucose cleanly, which I think you should be able to do if you have a healthy metabolism, you have to lower the free fatty acids, which we can do with SEA. You need to uh, generate some NAD+, which RALA can help with. Uh, I've been supplementing with a, a B vitamin complex that has uh, some niacinamide at mealtime. So that's a little NAD plus supplement. Um, don't go too crazy on niacinamide, uh, 50 milligrams at a time is all that you want. Too much is counterproductive. And so, but by doing those things, by using the RALA and the SAA and reducing branch chain amino acids and increasing glycine in about 10 days, uh, seven to 10 days, 
uh, I, I lowered my fasting blood glucose from pre-diabetic levels to just, <laughs> just below pre-diabetic levels. <laughs> Uh, which is a win, right? This is a, long, this is a long time coming. So I'm feeling really good about this, this strategy and this approach. The cultures with the highest metabolic rates in the world tend to be starch eating cultures. I'm talking about the Tsimani forager farmers in Bolivia. It was a Ponser paper. I'll, I'll put the link to that. I'm talking about um, rice farmers in Thailand. These are where you see huge metabolic rates. I, I wrote in the last thing about how uh, West Africa has very low rates of diabetes and they eat a lot of these um, things like cassava and plantain that have very low BCAA levels. So that's high starch and it's also low branch chain amino acids. So I think that's very interesting. What I'm gonna do next is to make sure my enzymes are actually working how they're supposed to work, right? And this is the whole key, I think. If you can get your enzymes to, to work effectively, if you can clear out um, the mitochondria and get the fuel to burn cleanly, which obviously is kind of easier said than done, but, but I think we're making progress here. So my next test, I'm going to do a home version of an oral glucose tolerance test. And so what you do in that is you, uh, sit down and you eat, like, I, th I have to look it up. I think it's 200 grams of, of glucose. So you can get this at a, um, at any pharmacy. They sell glucose capsules for, uh, for diabetics. And then you test two hours later, what's your fasting glucose? So the last time I did this, um, I, I got 180 was my fasting glucose. And so the, the ranges are like pre-diabetic is 140 to 200, right? Um, so I'm on the, I was on the upper end of the pre-diabetic range, which matches with my fasting blood glucose. Both things are suggesting I'm on the far end of that range. But the oral glucose tolerance test is a little different. You can have high fasting blood glucose one, because you're not burning glucose effectively. It can also be because your liver is doing too much gluconeogenesis. So fasting blood glucose is in a way uh, sort of less interesting to me than can I effectively burn the glucose when I eat it? And so that's what the oral glucose tolerance test is going to tell me. So ironically, I went down to the local uh, drugstore today and they didn't actually have glucose tablets. Uh, they were sold out. So <laughs> test delayed for a couple of days uh, till I can go into the big city, which is Ithaca, which is uh, not a big city, but that is coming up. So I'm excited to see if I can beat my old <laughs> record score of 180, which should be pretty easy to do. And based on where my fasting glucose is going, I'm feeling very confident about setting a new record. Um, and then the real exciting thing is going to happen in November. We're going to do a, uh, a rapid fat loss trial using uh, the disodium succinate, which I also sell at firenabottle.net slash shop. So uh, wait for that. That's when the real fun is going to break out. But I, I think I think the key to the disodium succinate is you have to be um, somewhat insulin sensitive first. You have to get because if you're obese and insulin resistant, your succinate dehydrogenase enzyme is probably not working very well. And that's the whole key to getting the succinate to work. So uh, fun times coming up, check in uh, on this Fire in a Bottle channel. Um, you can, I'm, I'm on Twitter at Fire underscore Bottle. I'm on, uh, go to Reddit, get a part of that group, r slash saturated fat. I'll see you guys soon.